Welcome to the 33rd Colloquio Brasileiro de Matemática, part of INTA Brazil. The title of our course is A Gentle Introduction to Fourier Analysis and Polytopes. This is our first lecture. So let's see, today we'll talk about uh, Fourier transforms of intervals, of boxes in two dimensions. And in particular, we'll have a nice example to get our hands dirty quickly with a, an application. So an example of uh, how to use the Fourier transform to solve a very concrete, simple problem in two dimensions. And of course, a bunch of definitions. So let's go, let's start. What does the Fourier transform of an interval look like? First, let's define the indicator function of an interval. It has this graph. It's very simple. It's one if x is inside the interval, zero if x is outside the interval. And let's see what is its Fourier transform. So what does the Fourier transform of an interval look like? By definition, we define it to be this integral over the whole real line. And we place the indicator function of the interval inside the integral, and we multiply it against this complex exponential. It's always the same complex exponential in, Fourier, in our Fourier uh, definitions, e to the minus 2 pi i x e x dx. The good news is that you only need to know calculus 1 and 2 in a bit of infinite series um, to understand these integrals, because the measure is always over the real line. dx is over, always over the real line or Euclidean space. We're not doing complex integrals here although it's a very beautiful and useful theory to know, and I recommend it, but here we'll stick to real measures. And so uh, the integral from negative infinity to infinity of the indicator function can be simplified, taking a Q from Fourier. We simplify it to the integral from A to B because by definition, the indicator function is zero outside of the interval from A to B. And so we integrate from A to B this exponential. And now there are several ways to go. Let's see what happens if we expand using Euler's formula, e to the i x is cosine x plus i sine x. Well, uh, this integral becomes a sum of two integrals, but two real integrals. The, uh, this first integral of the cosine is a real integral, and plus i times another real integral. So again, this is good news. We can use calculus one to evaluate these real integrals, and the evaluation is on the last line here. And so now all we have to do is evaluate at B, subtract the evaluation at A as follows, and we have an explicit answer. We do have to do some gymnastics a little bit. Uh, I'm going to put the I, remove the I from, from everything, put it on the bottom here, because we want to recognize cosine 2 pi C B minus I sine 2 pi C B, uh, again, using Euler's formula in the other direction. And so we arrive finally at this very explicit and simple answer for the transform of the interval. It's, a, it's just a difference of two complex exponentials divided by xc up to a constant, and valid for all xc non-zero. And oh, but wait, we're getting a message from Fourier. But this is this messy derivation really necessary? A bit harsh, huh? From the gallery over here on the right to Fourier, but he's right, you know. So he's right, it's not really necessary. Let's see uh, an alternate definition, an uh, alternate derivation. Um, if we are very comfortable with the complex exponential, then we can just take the antiderivative of the complex exponential, pretending that it's the same path as you would take for e to the cx, where c is a real number, except e to the cx now has c a complex number, namely minus 2 pi ixc. So, Pretending everything is okay, we can take the antiderivative, evaluate from A to B, and voila, we have the same answer very, very quickly. And this is the path we will take. The same as the previous answer, but obviously much better, much quicker. Um, but we might wonder how does one make this rigorous? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the rigorous approach for this. But the moral of the story, which I outlined in red here in a box, is, is important for us. Uh, the moral is that we should get very comfortable with the complex exponential function. So how can we understand the bigger picture of e to the z, the complex exponential, without breaking it up into cosine plus i sine? As we all know, in, in um, high school or whenever you learned about cosine x plus i sine x equals e to the i x, Euler's formula, we learned first cosine sine and then e to the i x. But in fact, the the, the more kind of holistic approach is to think of e to the z first, define that first, um, and then you, uh, define cosine and sine, and then see the relation between them more generally. 
So enter Weistrauss in here. Oh, look, Weistrauss is speaking Portuguese. Okay, ta rolando. Just means what's up. I'm glad you asked. And so Weistrauss enters the picture and develops very rigorously in a very beautiful way, all of real analysis from scratch, um, all of complex analysis, everything from scratch using initially just power series, then later on Laurent series, but initially just a power series. And it's very rigorous, very beautiful and unifies everything in a very simple and transparent uh, manner. So what Weierstrass did, and of course before him Riemann, but Weierstrass made it much more powerful. He defined e to the z to be the summation one over n factorial z to the n, n goes from zero to infinity. And notice that this is valid for all complex z. It's valid for all complex z. It converges very rapidly because the one over n factorial and converges absolutely. So we can rearrange terms as we like. And now we can do the same for cosine and sine. They have these uh, simple looking, uh, fairly simple infinite series. And then it's not difficult to see, and I leave it to you as an exercise, that once you have these three infinite series, these are by definition, this is the definition of cosine of z for any z complex, similarly for sine. And it's interesting that, of course, when z is real, the cosine of z has norm bounded by one. The absolute value of cosine x when x is real is less than or equal to one. But when z is complex, this is no longer true. So I encourage you to play with it. In any case, it's, it, one, it's not too difficult to prove that e to the z is cosine z plus i sine z for all complex z. And this is the extension of Euler's formula for all complex z, which we will use repeatedly. Once you have this machinery, uh, it's possible to uh, argue quite rigorously why the integral of the complex exponential is the antiderivative as, as we said it was in the second derivation, the easier version, because you can integrate all these series term by term and uh, similarly differentiate term by term and so on. So uh, by the way, it's also possible to replace Z by a matrix and, and then everything still converges. We have an infinite series of matrices that leads into Li groups, the algebras. We won't do that in this course, but it's a very interesting path. Um, let's see a very simple function, which is, on the face of it, it's called a Sawtooth function. f of x is x minus the integer part of x minus a half. These brackets will mean for us the integer part, the greatest integer less than or equal to x. And it has this simple looking graph. It's very, very nice. It's piecewise linear. Um, it has a discontinuity, discontinuity uh, at every integer, but that's also good as we'll see later. This periodic function with period one on the reals turns out to be a building block for our higher dimensional investigations later on. Erhard polynomials, other things, and that it can sum in number theory. So we might as well make friends with it now. So here's the sawtooth function. Here's the infinite series for the sawtooth function summation e to the two pi i n x over n. For now, we'll ask you to believe this infinite series exists. So we'll wanna see the, a little bit of the magic of it. And then later we'll prove this infinite series rigorously. It's the sum over all integers n except the zero n. And so this is our first Fourier series, yay. For graphing purposes, let's graph it. Um, it seems maybe like we can't graph it because it looks complex, but in fact, the left-hand side is real. And so uh, let's see if I can use the drawing uh, capacity here. This left-hand side uh, of the identity is a real valued function. And so therefore the right-hand side must also be real, even though it doesn't look like an interface. Let's see, let's uh, massage it a little bit and see why indeed it is real. This is a common trick. We'll take the nth term, we'll sum it with the minus nth term and these exponentials e to the two pi i n x plus e to the minus two pi i n x will combine again using Euler's formula to get a sine function, sine of two pi n x. So there it is, there's the real version. And now we can graph it um, in the plane. And so let me now erase these marks. Okay, so there's the graph. The dotted orange line is the sawtooth function. And we want to get as one approximated using Fourier series. The blue line is the first order approximation. It's the first term of that series we just wrote down on a previous slide. Uh, two terms, sum of two sine functions, three terms, four terms, 30 terms. 
Here we already see an interesting Gibbs phenomena, it's called, where we overshoot the true value of the function. And this is persistent, but we don't have to get into it here. But it's interesting to see these approximations. It's kind of fun to play with it and to see how closely things get approximated to the sawtooth function. Uh, more generally, we want to define the Fourier transform of any integrable function, f, whose domain is the reals, by this integral here. Uh, so the integral from negative infinity to infinity, f of x e to the minus 2 pi x c. Uh, I'll write here, this one can think of it as an inner product of f against this function. There's a good reason for the minus sign, by the way, as we'll see later. Um, uh, oh, let's see, sorry, I can put a, a plus sign here. And more generally, uh, maybe you remember from linear algebra that the inner product of f against g for any two real value, real, uh, any, any two complex valued functions whose domain is the real line, uh, this is by definition equal to the integral over the real line of f of x times g bar of x. So maybe uh, from linear algebra, you remember this version of the inner product for the function space of all functions whose domain is the real line. And so we see here that according to this definition, uh, from, which is really, again, linear algebra, this is really the inner product of, of f with the, with the exponential. And because of this bar, we see that the exponential be, gets a minus sign. So everything makes sense. And we will use this normalization always, 2 pi i, because this normalization works well for the orthogonality of the exponentials, which again, we'll, we'll go into later. So, so with this preamble, let's now see um, why things work. Um, well, so this is the Fourier transform of f, and we'll go into the more deep, more of the linear algebra details later on, but that's um, just to introduce you to it. Uh, for now, let's see, let's ask a little bit more about um, the intuition for two dimensional analogs of this. What's a natural way? So, again, here's the one dimensional version. What's a natural way to extend this to two dimensions? Here's one natural way, if you have a rectangle like the picture below, uh, whose dimensions from uh, along the x-axis are from A to B and then along the y-axis from C to D, it's natural to define it by multiplying two one-dimensional uh, Fourier transforms. So now the function is a function of two variables, a function of f of x, y, but we, we can consider the one-dimensional uh, integral for a transform along the x direction, then the one dimensional uh, transform along the y direction separately, combine them. And again, this is just an intuitive way to define it. If we combine them, let's see what happens. The exponent c1 x and the exponent exponential here c2 y, they combine to form x c1 plus y c2. And that's very interesting because the inner product presents itself naturally to us now. And so it appears very naturally, and that's very interesting. And so that suggests that the right definition should be the following. We'll define now the Fourier transform of any body. And when we say, when we say body here, we mean measurable subset B of the plane. Any, any, take any subset which is measurable. Uh, so for us, we don't need to, uh, I'm not expecting the audience to know measure theory, but anything that's, that sort of makes sense uh, to integrate over. So the, the Fourier transform of the indicator function of any such measurable set is the integral of the indicator function against multiplied by the complex exponential again. And by definition, again, the indicator function is zero when X is outside of B. So it's the same as integrating over B. We have the complex exponential. And this is really the definition now that we'll have for the Fourier transform of any uh, two dimensional measurable set B subset of the plane. In case this, the, the set B is a bounded set, in case it doesn't leak off to infinity, then the integral converges for all C in the plane. And later in the course, we'll also even consider C complex, but for now, C will be um, real vectors. And so that's, that's good. That's a fairly simple uh, definition to handle. And we know how to integrate it uh, as we did uh, before. Um, there is a beautiful uh, way to think of 
uh, Fourier transforms as extensions of volume. So what do we mean by that? Why is the Fourier transform a natural extension of the volume of an object? Luckily, it's easy to see. If we plug in C equal to zero, so let me use the, the uh, uh, C equal to zero. Let's, let's use the tools here available. Uh, I'm gonna plug C equal to zero into the definition that we just made. And when, when we plug in C equal to zero, let's see what happens. We have that the Fourier transform of B at zero by definition is the integral over, well, it's the integral over B. And we integrate against the exponential, but now the exponential reduces to unity. It's just equal to one because we plug it in Z equal, X equal to zero. So it's e to the zero equals one. And so it's the integral of dx. But look, that's just the volume of the body. The integral of dx over b is the volume of the body by definition of volume. That is the definition of volume, this integral of one dx over the, the body b. And so that's nice. It shows that the volume of anything is really a special case of the transform. And this leads to a very beautiful and powerful philosophy that in order to prove identities or inequalities between volumes in geometry or differential geometry, one can ascend to the level of transforms, a function space, and, and where we have more tools, we have more possibilities to handle things. And then using the technology above of the function space, after we do stuff there with more tools, then we descend by just plugging in C equal to zero and we'll get uh, interesting non-trivial identities between volumes. So it's a very interesting philosophy. We will pursue that philosophy to get uh, one of the Brion theorems and then a specialization of it in, in the next few lectures. All right, so now let me get rid of these markings. So the, I wanna show you a motivating problem. By that we, we're gonna mean, uh, we're gonna tile a two dimensional rectangle by nice little rectangles and here's a definition of that the Bruin gave uh, in the 60s in a very nice two page paper in the American Math Monthly. He said, suppose we are given a rectangle P, which enjoys the property that at least one of its sides is an integer. We'll call such a rectangle a nice rectangle. And now suppose, as in this picture on the right, that we tile a rectangle by little nice rectangles. In other words, we start with a big rectangle and we tile it with little nice rectangles uh, such that each little rectangle, one of its sides, either its length or its width, or possibly both, is an integer, but we don't know which one. Then the conclusion is that the large rectangle um, will also be nice. So here is the, the theorem of De Bruin that we want to prove using our, our very basic Fourier definitions that we just had today already. Suppose we tile a fixed rectangle P with nice little rectangles then P itself must be nice. In other words, one of the big sides must be an integer and we don't know which, uh, but one of them must be or both. So let's prove this theorem of De Bruin from the 60s. By our tiling hypothesis, we have that the indicator function of the large rectangle is a finite linear combination of indicator functions of the little rectangles modulo overlaps on the boundaries where the little rectangles uh, touch each other on the, on the boundary. But so I designated those by a little sum of plus or minus indicator functions of lower dimensional polytopes, which just means line segments in our case. Uh, we don't have to really worry about it because when, once we take the Fourier transform of both sides, um, these little things will go away because we're gonna integrate with a two dimensional integral over a one dimensional line segment, which will vanish by definition of the two dimensional measure. So here's the definition of the two dimensional Fourier transform of a rectangle again, just like we did before. So now we're used to this. And so uh, the two, for any two dimensional rectangle, as in this picture, the Fourier transform at C is this two dimensional uh, integral with a complex exponential as always. And just to recap from the last slide, the first line is here. The second line we already saw we can, because the rectangle is the, a direct product of intervals, because its sides are aligned with their parallel, its sides are parallel to the axes. Uh, this is a product of the interval A to B cross the interval C to D. And so we can do separation of variables in this case and multiply the integrals together to give this integral. 
in general, we can't do that for any arbitrary uh, subset of the plane because an arbitrary subset is not a product space. However, for integrals, we can do this. We can separate variables. And then we get a product of these um, formulas, which we've already seen. They're kind of nice, simple formulas, as we saw in the beginning of today for the Fourier transform of an interval. So it's a product of Fourier transforms of two intervals. Having done that uh, for the Fourier transform of a rectangle, whose sides are parallel to the axes, we have this uh, formula for, for the Fourier transform of a rectangle. Well, let's designate this formula by equation two. And now we have a product here of these two terms that we see. I factored out this e to the minus two pi i c one a plus c two c. Why? Because I want to see exactly when things vanish. And so to highlight exactly when things vanish, we have now this, let's see what happens. When, whenever, um, by the way, this formula is valid for all c one, c two real vectors, except for the union of the two lines c one equals zero and c two equals zero. Um, because we have to divide by C1, C2. Let's take a small leap of faith at this point and say that this transform of the rectangle is zero if and only if R is a nice rectangle. But we have to be more specific. When it's, is it zero? It's going to be zero for all C integer vectors, except for the zero vector. We already know what happens when C is a zero vector. We get the area of R. The area is always uh, the, the special case of the transform at the zero vector. However, for non-zero integer vectors, we claim that we have this uh, kind of dictionary. Oh, we're getting, oh, we're getting a cool thumbs up from Fourier. Um, why thumbs up? Because this is the first time, this is exciting because it's the first time we have a, a dictionary between a nice geometric property and a nice Fourier property. And so we have a dictionary that allows us to go back and forth between geometric properties and Fourier properties. And we'll have many more in the future. So let's go, usually let's prove this claim. And then we'll use the, the, the claim to prove the, the theorem. So one piece at a time. To prove the claim, um, we already know that a transform of the rectangle uh, has a certain equation, let's recall, this equation two here, I'm just writing it again so we don't have to go back. And so here we already did this equation two. Um, we already showed it. So the Fourier transform of the rectangle has this formula. And so when is it zero? It's zero from the formula if and only if we have that this, this product here is zero. So because this product appears in this formula. And so uh, we have already this interesting uh, little fact. And now we can uh, proceed. Let's put this uh, little fact or red um, fact over to the side. We already know it. And by this um, product being zero, that's true if and only if, it's true if and only if the exponentials are both one. Well, that's true because a product this product is zero if only if the exponential equals one or if this exponential equals one. But now we have a very interesting um, phenomena due to Euler again, that e to the two pi i theta for any real theta is one if and only if theta is an integer. So again, e to the two pi i theta when theta is real is one if and only if theta is an integer. I urge you to prove this if you haven't seen it before. Very, very useful. We'll use this again and again through the course. And so using this property um, of the uh, ex complex, complex exponential, we have that uh, the C1 times B minus A, this, this fellow here is, uh, must be an integer because of this property. And, or, or this must be an integer or both. And so now we have equation three, this integral property uh, of, the C, of the Xs times the lengths and widths of the rectangle. And so that's very useful. Um, so let's recap uh, what we have now. Let me clear these drawings. What we have, um, it, now we wanna prove the claim using this equivalence. So, so, so far we have equation three back again, that the transform of the rectangle is zero, if and only if we have this integrality property. 
Let's use that to prove the claim. So first suppose the rectangle is a nice rectangle. Then by definition, one of its sides is an integer without also generality, b minus a is an integer. And therefore c1 times b minus a is an integer for all c1, c2 integer vectors. Why? Because a product of two integers is an integer. And so by equation three, we see that the Fourier transform of the rectangle is zero for all integer vectors except zero. Um, so we already see that if R is a nice rectangle, then we have this Fourier condition that we wanted to prove in the claim. So that's one direction. So that's, that was easy by equation three. Uh, conversely, suppose that, the Fourier, that we have this property, the Fourier property that the Fourier vanish, vanishes, the Fourier transform of the rectangle vanishes for all C integer vectors, except zero. In particular, the Fourier transform uh, vanishes when C is equal to the one, one vector. Let's plug in xi equal one comma one. Well, uh, let's see what that tells us. But again, by equation three, here, this was here, the, the remember this was the, the xi one. Let me draw it using the tool. This was the, the xi one um, uh, coordinate. So here xi one equals one by definition. We're letting xi one equal one. We're letting xi two equal one as well. And so by, the by equation three on the previous slide, we have this, um, we have that B minus A is an integer or D minus B is an integer, but that's, that's what we wanted. By definition, B minus A, that's the length and this is the width. So either the length or the width or both are integers. That proves the claim. So, so again, that's very nice. That shows us that now we have the claim. So let's go back to what the claim was just to see what we proved again, uh, let's see, I'm gonna try to, here's the claim. Suppose that R is a rectangle whose sides are parallel to the axis, then R is a nice rectangle, if and only if the Fourier transform vanishes for all integer vectors except zero. So we have this dictionary now. So that's very nice in itself and worth remembering uh, by itself because that will have an extension later on that will play a role in the geometry of numbers of Minkowski. But uh, for now, it's part of this uh, little theorem of De Bruyne. Let's go back now and try to use this claim to finish the proof of De Bruyne's theorem. Uh, we'll first start with a triangulation of P. Remember, P was a large rectangle. We, triang we, um, we tile it with little um, rectangles, uh, R sub one, R sub two, R sub three, we call them. And we had this from the very beginning. And now we take the Fourier transform of both sides. To get comfortable with this, to make it rigorous, I'll just talk you through it. Really, we take this identity one, we multiply both sides by the complex exponential and we integrate over the whole plane. And that's it. So that's what it means to take the Fourier transform of both sides. So it's rigorous. And the reason we don't have any uh, error terms here is because these indicator functions are indicator functions of line segments. And we, when we take a two-dimensional integral, by definition, it's zero because the measure is a two-dimensional measure of the integral so we're using. And these are just one-dimensional line segments. So we have this identity of transforms. And now by hypothesis, each little rectangle is a nice rectangle. By our claim, that happens if and only if the Fourier transform vanishes. So all of these summands vanish for all C integer vectors, except zero. And so therefore, because all of these sum ends vanish, the whole sum vanishes. And therefore the big Fourier transform of, the, of, the, of P is zero because it's a sum of zeros. And so it's zero, when is it zero? It's zero exactly when C's are integer vectors as we see here. And now using the converse, the converse part of the claim, we can conclude therefore that this Fourier condition by the claim implies that P is a nice rectangle. And that's it, that's the end of the proof. Fairly easy, I think, fairly straightforward anyway, and uh, shows the power of these for already very simple definitions of these Fourier integrals. So what have we done? We've proved the Bruin's theorem. And um, the exercises for today are from my book, which is uh, published by IMPA, A Friendly Introduction to Fourier Analysis and Polytopes. I, I encourage you to do uh, these exercises from chapter one and chapter two and see how it goes. Um, one has to practice to get better, of course. Uh, and that's the end of our lecture one. Uh, please stay tuned for our next 
um, lecture. And thank you for your attention and for listening and for your interest. Ciao.